All right, welcome everybody. Welcome. Um, we've, we got this meeting recorded. We're going to go through a few things this morning um, and review some stuff for our kind of our first question and answer session in class. I'll give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions here in a bit. I do have some information to to share with you guys. Um, I'll put my document camera back up on the screen. Um, today what we're going to do is we're just going to do a little introduction. I'll spend some time touring our Canvas uh, site. We'll also look at the Power Portal. We'll talk a little bit about tools, review some engine numbers, and I'm going to show you where a teardown script is at on Canvas and how to use that. Um, and we're not, we're going to try to do this uh, fairly quickly and not keep you here more than an hour. So with that, I'm going to uh, jump into some stuff. So my name is uh, Ben French. Uh, a lot of my students will call me Mr. French and I am the guy in this picture right here. I have uh, uh, years and years of small engine experience, whether it was goat carts or motorcycles or lawnmowers. Um, it's just, I really enjoy working on, on small engines and I'm excited that you guys are taking this class uh, and kind of jumping into the fold, learning about small engines as well. So um, with that, let's see if I can get this to move down there so it's a little bit out of the way. In fact, what I'll do for now is I'm going to go ahead and close out our document camera. All right. Um, so I want to do one more thing. I want to put up the chat here. And that way, if you have a question or something and you don't feel like asking it, you, you can put it in here. In fact, I'm going to ask you guys a question. And my question is, is can you see my screen? And can you see our Canvas web page up on the screen? And you could respond back in the chat or yeah. Okay, or you could just talk. Perfect. Very good. All right, so um, this is our home page. What I'm trying to do to set up your classes to get pretty much everything you would need would be in the modules page. Now you can link directly to assignments or to announcements um, and review those announcements and, and different things. But really the majority of what you'll need in class will be on the modules um, page. Now, I do want to go back to the home page real quick and just point out a few things. Anything you haven't done in class should come up over here. So like on my student view, I had not reviewed um, some of these um, some of these annou announcements. So if I go in there and look at it and I go back, I can then you know decide, okay, I've closed that out. Um, and so anything you, you, you need to do should come up on the, on the right hand side here. Um, there's also a calendar feature that is pretty nice to let you know what do you have to do, right? So here we are, it's the 23rd. I should have put a thing on here for first class. Um, but I do have all the different things on here that are um, due. Now, See how this particular one says SP2 online safety tests? That's because under this login, I've submitted that. So anytime you do an assignment, a line will go through it on the right-hand side. So there's several things that you wanna get working on that are due next week, whether it's responding to the discussion of what are your projects or your Briggs and Stratton force, force cycle theory test. Um, if I click it, it's pretty nice. It takes me right to that activity and I, I've tried to build all the links into things. Um, so there, there's all kinds of, um, you know, good stuff on here. And um, we'll try one more. Here's the still Bowtech one. Takes a minute to load there, but there's, there's that assignment. So the calendar is a good way for you to see what you have to do. Right, you know, a lot of times students want to know, well, what do I got to do to pass this class? Look at the calendar. You do have this reminder bar here on the side. 
Okay, I'm going to jump into modules. And today, um, uh, we'll, we'll point out uh, a few things. Uh, one of the first things you want to be working on, and it was already crossed off on the calendar under this login, because uh, I've already done it here. Um, I used this login when I made a, made a video on how to do the safety test. Um, but if you haven't already taken the safety test, Here's the invitation and how to get into the safety test. And then this is finally the assignment of how you do the safety test and submit it so that you can uh, get points for doing it. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the other thing you wanna be working on is learning about engines, right? And uh, so that's our next section. In fact, um, if you bought the small engines textbooks, textbook, um, I've loaded all the, um, all the presentations that correspond with that textbook here in Canvas. And so um, today we're gonna take a look at this module two, which is this shop safety and tools and you can choose to download it as a pdf so it's still loading right now but you can choose to download it as a pdf if i click that corner and you can see it's it's downloading or you can choose just to review it right on the canvas site i'll go ahead and open up the pdf to make it a little bit more clear for us. Again, if, if you have the small engines textbook, this will line up right with that thing. Um, you know, it talks about what type of oil to use and how oils are classified. Most of your Briggs and Stratton small engines will just recommend a standard 30 weight engine oil. So they have some notes on that and fire and safety. Now, Obviously, if you go through and do the online safety test, the SP2 safety test, you're going to get way more detailed information in shop safety than even what is in this um, uh, presentation here. There's a couple notes on here of, hey, don't run your small engines in an enclosed environment, right? The, the exhaust gases are toxic. The carbon monoxide will, will put you to sleep and take you out. So make sure you're working in a well-ventilated area. They have notes on proper clothes, proper attire. Um, this one in particular, I actually worked with a with a uh, a guy, and he thought um, he thought he could just blink real fast when using the wire wheel on his pedestal grinder there, and that's uh, that's never a good idea. Now these grinders should always have the little shields on them, but you should be wearing some eye protection. Th this person here is actually wearing face protection. Definitely a good idea there. So they have uh, different things for, you know, using the parts washer, right? They recommend you wear gloves, oil resistant shoes, all the labeling. But what I'm really want to get down here to is um, ultimately the part where it talks about tools. Now again, here they got a nice wash tank here. I'll give you some uh, parts washing tips later. And believe it or not, like when they build a, a small engine shop, they actually lay out the floor plan and try to make that as efficient as possible. And Briggs and Stratton actually has a recommended floor layout plan for their, their sharp shop partners. All right, but here is the screen I wanted to get to. And that's the screen here on tools. Um, this page is a great page just to learn all your different types of tools, names of tools. In fact, it might be worth it for me just to take this, suck this picture off of here and make it a, a separate um, a separate item under the modules. Because it's if someone doesn't know what different tools are called, this is probably about the easiest way to start learning it is you can look at the picture, read the little description. So we have an open end wrench, we have a box and wrench, we have a combination wrench. All right, so, so this does a pretty good job. They're showing an electric impact. Now you can get a lot of these that are, are cordless electric impacts that are really nice. 
Um, they have air powered ones, which are very powerful, but it requires you to have a, a supply of compressed air, screwdrivers, pliers, all your basic tools, files, tap and a die for cutting threads, different types of hammers. Now is where we're into some of our specialty tools. And I, I did want to point out some of these things like uh, the starter clutch wrench, that's going to be very particular. That's, that's how you get the pull starter mechanism off of some of the older engines. The valve spring compressor, if you're working on a flathead engine and you want to take out the valve springs, or really it's, you can get them out by hand, but if you want to put them back in there, you're going to need to have that little valve spring compressor. The flywheel puller is really nice to have. And I will have to tease Briggs and Stratton a little bit. They really like their logo. So if you look at this flywheel puller, it actually is shaped like the Briggs and Stratton logo. Um, here's a tang bender for doing governor adjustments. The flywheel, flywheel holder um, on some of your finned flywheels that helps keep it from spinning. Um, piston ring compressors. And then ultimately a, a digital multimeter DMM. Sometimes they'll call it a DVOM for um, digital volt ohm meter. I'm going to get some of our drawing tools up and I'm going to write that on there DVOM, digital volt ohm meter. Or a lot of times these are called just DMMs, digital multimeters. And this is a, a definitely a worthwhile tool to get. Um, you can get these from you know places like Harbor Freight for less than ten dollars. So there's they're definitely accessible. All right, um, moving right along, spark testers. That's super handy to have in diagnostics. In fact, um, if you're like me and you drive like um, older cars and and different things, having this spark tester here. Um, is something that I'll, I'll throw, I'll, I'll get a couple of these and throw one in my glove box. So if my car breaks down somewhere, I can at least see, well, is the problem spark or is it fuel? Can I, is there something I can fix here quickly and avoid myself a tow or not? So super useful tool. Um, I'll clear my drawings out of there. And then we get into some of the other um, specialty tools like this leak down tester. Um, this is normally something we do in class. However, a leak down tester requires you to have compressed air, um, which I know a lot of folks aren't going to have at home. I'm going to demonstrate that tool in a future video. All right. Um, so as we're talking about tools, I think what makes more sense is for us to actually look at some real tools. And so I'm going to exit out of this um, presentation, I'll go ahead and go back to the modules page. And right now we're still in this module one area, but I'm gonna go ahead and minimize that and I'll put back up my document camera. so that we can look at some, some tools. All right. Um, so a, um, a good selection of pliers is always nice to have. And you know, these, these tools last a long time. This guy right here is probably 60 or 70 years old. Um, it's got some engraving on it. It's hard to see, but it says SPRRCO. Uh, it's Southern Pacific Railroad Company. This was my great grandfather's. It was um, his uh, channel lock pliers that he used as a machinist for Southern Pacific Railroad. And, um, you know, he was a machinist for them um, starting somewhere in the 1940s. Uh, and working up until the 70s. So, um, you know, you get some good tools that'll last you a long time. So these are channel lock pliers are commonly called after the brand or adjustable pliers. Of course, 
working on things, you're going to have to have some, some needle nose pliers, right? So I got some needle nose pliers up on the screen there. You're also going to need some wire cutters. Sometimes they're, they're called side cutters. Um, what else? You know, what I didn't bring up here is uh, screwdrivers, but I can grab a few of those. We have those handy. Of course, you want a good selection of Phillips and standard. Of course, I put the standard down and said the word Phillips on. Huh? So there's a standard screwdriver. Here's a Phillips screwdriver, right? And um, having a little tiny pocket screwdriver, super handy to have. Um, uh, if you come and take classes with us this fall, some of the hands-on classes, I'll, I'll give you one of these because we have we had a bunch of them made uh, for the for the school. So and it's it's unbelievable how handy that pocket screwdriver is. I, I use it all the time. Um, so we'll get the pliers and screwdrivers out of the way there. And uh, let's talk about ratchets and sockets, right? Um, for small engine stuff, you know, I, I, you know, actually you probably use all three of these different sizes. However, the 3 8 size is the most popular. Now when we say 3 8 what are we talking about? Well, if I were to take a, a ruler and measure the size of that socket drive there, that would be three eighths of an inch. This one would be a quarter of an inch. And this guy right here would be a half inch. So this is a three eighths ratchet, quarter inch drive ratchet, half inch drive ratchet. And of course the sockets that you use on there have to correspond. So this half inch socket's not gonna go on the three eighths or the, um, or the quarter inch, it's made to go on the half inch drive. And of course, this one right here is a Snap-on one, right? Where Snap-on's initial claim to fame was this system where you had sockets that snapped on and then you know, also off that were interchangeable with the ratchets. Before that, this, this was all one tool. And if I wanted a different size, like this one happens to be, 19 millimeters. If I wanted a different size, I'd have to have a different one of these for the next size. Now that brought something up as far as the size of that that socket in that it's metric. And so I need to talk a little bit about metric and standard. So here I have a combination wrench. Why is it combination? because I have my box end and my open end over here, right? Which is your most popular style of wrench. And I have it in fractional half inch. I also have it in metric here, 13 millimeters. I guess I'll flip that around, make it a little easier to see. So half inch and 13 millimeters. I have another combination wrench, that one's 17 millimeters. Nineteen millimeters and three quarters of an inch. Now, um, what do you want to get? Do you want to get metric tools or do you want to get standard tools? It kind of depends on what you're working on. If you are working on a lot of uh, older engines, older pieces of equipment, okay, they're going to be standard. Briggs and Stratton up until the 1990s, and in some cases even like early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, would use fractional nuts and bolts on their engines. But throughout the 1990s, even the American companies, Tecumseh, Briggs, started to switch over to metric. If you were only working on more modern engines, I would, I would just have metric stuff. However, if you're going to work on older engines, American engines, then I would have uh, fractional stuff. And, and honestly, you'd probably want to have a little bit of both. There's a lot more product out these days that uses metric. The same thing applies to cars, guys. Um, even American cars 
in the in the 80s and 90s american cars started to switch over to metric so now everything's metric i use my metric tools a lot more than my standard tools unless i happen to be working on an older american car or an older engine where it's using uh, standard size fasteners okay so metrics a lot more popular in this day and age but it really depends on what engines you plan on working on in the class if you're going to be working on older stuff that's a, that's built by american manufacturers then you're going to want fractional stuff but if you're working on things like hondas kawasaki suzuki's uh you know any of your japanese uh, engines or, or motorcycles or, you know, that's all going to be, um, that's all going to be, uh, metric stuff. All right. Um, so we laid out some tools. Now I, I want, I did want to share that there is a relationship here between the, um, the fractional stuff and the metric stuff. In fact, these two I've laid on the screen, um, they're pretty close to being the same size. Likewise, these two, even though they're different lengths, I look at the open ends, they're also very close to being the same size. There is some correlation between the two in that some sizes kind of line up with other sizes. So like 13 millimeters will fit a bolt that has a one half inch head on it. It's going to be slightly loose, but it's going to work. 19 millimeters will work in place of three quarters and vice versa because they're pretty darn close. 14 millimeters, 9 sixteenths. In fact, I'll go ahead and write some of this stuff down and then I will show you how I came to that. So what we're going to say is, is metric. And then over here in this column, we'll put our, we'll put our SAE, our standard. And so, yeah, there, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of common, common sizes. For instance, seven sixteenths, that's pretty close to 11 millimeters. Like I said earlier, one half, 13 millimeters, nine sixteenths, 14 millimeters. Um, uh, we, we talked about the, the three quarters, 19 millimeters. Um, so, so how do you figure this out? Well, honestly, you could probably ask Google and Google will tell you uh, but there's another way to figure it out. Um, uh, and what that is, if I can get some of this stuff out of my screen here, I'm going to switch this back to the computer. 19 millimeters. I to buy 25.4. Yes. Okay. That's how it, so you, you take your, um, your metric size, you divide it by 25.4 and you're going to get a fractional value. So 0.74 or um, uh, 0.748. Now, if I did the same thing and I, and I said, okay, well, um, I want to divide out uh, three quarters of an inch. It's going to be 0.75, right? So it's just, Mathematically, some of the sizes and metric come out to be uh, pretty close to the same size and standard. And so you can correlate those two guys together. So that side tangent went kind of bad on me, but you get the idea, right? So you can, you can cheat, I call it a little bit there and um, get some of these to work in place of the others. But again, the, the basic rule is that if you're working on more modern engines, you're gonna want uh, metric tools. If you're working on older engines that are, are built in America, um, you're gonna want standard stuff. 
Okay, so I need to finish this up on, on tools. Um, so all kinds of things from having a ball peen hammer to having a brass punch. Now, why do sometimes we want like a brass hammer or a brass punch? Because if I'm beating on something and I don't want to tear up what I'm working on, I need that, that component to be a softer metal. So brass is softer than steel. So you can use it to add some persuasion to something without, without destroying what you're working on. Um, other things, if I'm doing a valve adjustment, I'm gonna need to have some feeler gauges. So that's kind of a specialty thing. It was on the tool slide there, but it's a specialty version of it, some feeler gauges and keeping the precision measurement thing going. Uh, some of you guys might want to get a set of micrometers or um, a dial caliper if you want to do some precision measurement. This is kind of an optional thing, but um, if you're doing fine measurements of engine parts, a set of micrometers would be something that you'd want to have. Um, okay, I realized that I do need to take a step back because I had showed you the ratchets, um, but I have something that looks like a ratchet that's more than a ratchet. This is a torque wrench, and this is a click style torque wrench, and if you look at it, it is, it's quarter inch drive. What you're going to want to have when you start doing a lot of small engines work is uh, an inch pound torque wrench. So this can measure how much tightness you're applying, how much force you're applying. Now that's a click style. This would be a, a more basic, a, a more inexpensive beam style. And if I zoom in on the, on the readings on the screen and I get it to focus, you can see that it says it's in inch pounds and you can measure that this one goes up to 300 inch pounds. Now there's 12 inch pounds in one foot pound. So you can kind of do, do the math on that, right? Like if you were um, tightening something up to a hundred inch pounds, well, that's, that's going to be a little bit less than um, 10, 10 foot pounds, right? But there, you know, it's 12 inch pounds in a foot pound. Now, um, since I have these torque wrenches up on the screen, this one is a 3 8 And so I can put a 3 8 socket on there. I'm also putting on an extension. I'm a big believer in trying to get away from your work. So not only having sockets and ratchets and different things, but having extensions is really nice to have. Speaking of sockets, I, I showed this in a different video, but this is a spark plug socket. That would be a specialty kind of socket you'd want to have to remove your spark plugs. This one's size happens to be 13 sixteenths. So I can't share enough how much I like um, having extensions. And then if you're doing um, uh, some specialty work, like maybe some of you guys in the class are doing a lot of work on motorcycles and stuff. The guys who work on bikes really like to have these T-handles. And this is probably one of my favorite little tools right here. It's a T-handle that's quarter inch drive. And so I can put three different socket sizes on there, right? So three sizes that would be real popular if you're working on, let's say a Honda, would be 10 millimeters, eight millimeters and 12 millimeters. Well, I could put all three sizes on this, on this tool and be, and be ready to go. So those, those are super nice because you can, you can break it loose, you can spin it out pretty fast. Um, there were a couple of other specialty tools in the, um, in the chapter. So we'll do a couple of those. Um, we saw a flywheel puller in the chapter. This thing right here is a flywheel knocker. I labeled this one I used on my clone engines back when I was building a lot of those. 
So I use that tool to pull the flywheel off um, for grounding the ignition system, some doing some tests. It's helpful to have a little jumper wire there. And then in the presentation, you saw a, a spark tester. So that's the actual Briggs and Stratton factory spark tester, but you can get similar spark testers from your auto parts store. Here's what I want to point out. These two tools do the same job. What they do is they'll tell you, am I getting spark to the spark plug? Right? Am I getting spark to the spark plug? Notice, notice the gap in here is not very big. A small engine electrical system, the fire spark plug, that's called the ignition system, it can't put out a ton of power. It's not like a car that can put out 100,000 volts to jump a spark plug gap. It can maybe put out 10 to 15,000 volts. So you have to make the gap here small. This one here is adjustable, right? So if I adjust this to where it's by the 20, like it is right now, in theory, it takes 20,000 volts to get electricity to jump that gap. If I want the electricity to jump a gap and I want it to take 30,000 volts to jump that gap, I have to make that quite a bit bigger, right? So if I'm doing a small engine, I want this thing down where the S is, right? And the S stands for standard uh, ignition, E is for electronic. But I want this down here at the S where it's a small gap and, and that's what a small engine could, could handle. If you make the gap bigger on one of these adjustable ones, if the gap's all the way over here, it'll look like you have spark or you, you don't have spark when you do because the ignition system just isn't capable of jumping that big of a gap. So the Briggs and Stratton factory one is fixed. You don't have to have that particular one. In fact, I like this one better but I have to tell myself when I'm working on a small engine, this gap's got to be on the smaller side of things. So that's a spark tester, super useful. If you have an engine that doesn't run and you want to know, well, is it not getting spark to the spark plug? That's a great way to, to figure that out with that spark tester. Okay, um, one last specialty tool and then we probably should get things moving forward. Um, this guy here is a strap wrench. So if I want to loosen up, let's say like the flywheel uh, nut, the, it, when I go to do that, the whole engine wants to rotate. This tool here can strap around the flywheel and basically it can hold something that's round and prevent it from spinning. And because it's a, a nylon strap, it doesn't, it doesn't tear up what you're, what you're trying to hold. Um, so for some of you guys, you'll need a strap wrench. Now, in this class to try to make things easy on you guys for tools. Um, I've set up your assignments where you have to um, take some stuff apart, but you don't necessarily have to put it together. <laughs> and so, um, and the reason is, is quite frankly, it, it, anybody who's taken anything apart knows that, hey, it's, it's a lot harder to uh, get things put back together than it is to take them apart. And uh, you're gonna need more specialty tools if you're putting something together. Um, so um, related to that, uh, I want to show you some resources that you, that you have here. And I just loaded these on. Um, I have an InTech rebuild presentation and an Indec teardown worksheet. If I click this InTech rebuild presentation, it's basically a complete PowerPoint that I've loaded into PDF and it shows you step by step. If I let it load. It shows you step by step how to take apart one of these engines. Um, Again, if I click this button, I can download this presentation. That's what I've already done here. So this is the teardown script that matches this engine, which means it tells you what, what you know, tools to use, what size sockets, what the torque specs are, what, you know, 
it tells you line item per line item what to do next. But here's that, here's that PowerPoint finally loaded. I'm going to go ahead and put it up on our screen this way. Um, and even if you don't happen to be working on this InTech engine, which would be like this guy right here, this is a really common engine. In fact, this is Briggs and Stratton's popular horizontal shaft um, uh, overhead valve engine that they designed and put into um, production in the early 2000s. A lot of your engines, whether it's you know Hondas or, or heck, I've even seen a Subaru small engine that basically pretty much followed the same design layout. So this is the teardown script for this engine and it goes through each, each different thing. In fact, we'll spend some time on some of those earlier slides, but I just wanna show you guys that it shows you the specialty tools. It goes through the gaskets. It has a complete step-by-step -step of this is how you would take all these things apart. It even shows you the tool list on there. There's that strap wrench I was talking about. So if you wanna loosen that flywheel nut in the middle, uh, you're going to need a, a big socket. They're using a half inch dry breaker bar um, because it's actually tightened up. It's torqued down, I want to say around um, 60 foot pounds. So it takes quite a bit of force to break this loose. And that's actually how you use the strap wrench, how they have it angled there. I see a lot of people, they can't get the strap wrench to work and because they haven't put it on correctly. They think that this, um, this, curved in, they want to put it on the curved flywheel and they're using it wrong and so it just slips. So it shows you the specialty tools um, to use uh, on the on this presentation. And even goes through some uh, reassembly stuff. I'll put one of these up for a flathead engine as well. Um, and you can use those as a guide for just about any engine because um, they'll all be relatively similar. But let me go back up to um, the beginning of this presentation because there are some things I want to share with you. For instance, the majority of our small engines are air-cooled small engines. So um, what, it, what does that mean? Well, that means that we're not going to have a radiator on the front of the engine like this engine here ha has a is a liquid cooled engine so it's got a radiator there it's got a water pump to circulate the coolant that's inside here i'll make the coolant green because you'd mix antifreeze with your water to make it coolant and it would circulate that coolant from the radiator through the water pump through the engine block remove the excess heat of the engine and back right um, a high performance engine, oftentimes it's going to be water cooled because it makes so much heat, it needs the water cooling to remove that heat from the engine. But it dramatically increased, increases the complexity of the engine. It also inc increased the costs. So the majority of our small engines are going to be air cooled, not because it's necessarily better, but you know, it's simpler. Air cooling has less parts. It's going to cost less money, less room um, to, to fit it all in there. So that also makes the engine lighter. Um, and so for those three reasons right there, is what, why we're going to tend to be air cooled for our small engines. Um, now on the downside, air cooling does tend to make the engine run hotter than a, than a water cooled engine. Um, water cooled engines are, are typically going to last longer because they're not they're not running as hot. Um, but you know it's just kind of a, a, a compromise. What what are you after, right? The lower production costs and the simplicity of air cooling is why the majority of our small engines are going to be um, are going to be air cooled. Okay, so that's one way to classify an engine. By the way, it can be an air cooled engine or a water cooled engine, right? All right, so uh, we looked at this picture before. Um, 
This is a horizontal crankshaft configuration. This is an Intec uh, 305, I want to say. So it's 305 uh, cc's of displacement. That's the inside. That's how you figure out the bore and the stroke. It's 305 cc's. Um, this type of engine, you'd see it on generators, log splitters, snow blowers, like it says on the screen there. A lot of you guys in this class, though, will probably end up with one of these, a vertical shaft engine. Okay, so you, you can't necessarily see on this diagram, but it has a shaft, the PTO sh shaft. PTO stands for power takeoff. P T O. So it goes up and down, it goes straight out of the bottom. And this is where you'd have an attachment to put on your lawnmower blade. So your push behind, you know, lawnmower engines, even a lot of your riding lawnmower engines are going to be vertical shaft engines, meaning that the crankshaft goes up and down and that crankshaft then spins a lawnmower blade like that. And I do want to say that, hey, if, if you were going to take an engine and you wanted to build a go-kart or some type of a mini bike or something, um, a vertical shaft engine would not be what you want, okay? You can't just take this engine and flip it over on its side and run it. The lubrication system in it is designed for this engine to sit this way. So you'd burn up the engine trying to run it in a horizontal configuration. If you want to build an engine and put it on a goat cart or a mini bike or something like that, what you're going to want is that horizontal crankshaft engine where the crankshaft like this one, if I clear out my, my drawings here, on this guy, the crankshaft is going horizontally, right? So it's coming out the back of the engine like this and it's gonna rotate around like that. So that would be the type of engine you want. And I get that question a lot. I've seen a lot of people, uh, a lot of students over the years, they end up with a vertical crankshaft engine and uh, they want to put it on a goat cart and that's just, that's just not gonna work out for you. Okay, I know that's another way to um, classify the engine. How's the crankshaft going in there, right? Is it vertical shaft or horizontal shaft? Um, both of these engines in this Im image are water cooled but you have one engine that's a flathead or L-head engine and another engine that's overhead valve. So what, what's that talking about? Well, L-head engines are just that, the engine cylinder head, which is this top area here of the engine. This cylinder head is just that, it's flat. It has a space for the spark plug to thread in it. It's got some uh, holes in it for the for it to be bolted down, but that I mean it's it's flat. There's nothing there's nothing in it other than the spark plug screwed in the top. The the valves are in the engine block, and if I look at the way these valves are, they're off to the side, and then the cylinder and piston. They go up and down, and the valves are over here. So they call this engine design a L head. And I will make that bigger because it kind of goes like an upside down L, right? When you think I got my valves here and I got my piston and cylinder over here. So that's why they call it an L head or a lot of times people will call it a flat head. If you heard about the old like flat head Ford that hot rodders used to use in their hot rods and stuff, that's that has same type of cylinder head on that. Um, the camshaft, this guy right here is down in the engine block and so are the valves. So that's your L head or flat head engine. Okay. If I go to my next screen here and I clear out all the scribbles, now I'm at my overhead valve engine. So overhead valve would be this design here. Again, this is the L head, right? Because it goes like this and like that. This guy over here is the overhead valve engine. And I'm actually gonna circle that with some green around there because this thing is a lot greener in that it runs a lot cleaner. 
so I have my valves entering the cylinder head. It does make the, the engine significantly taller. It makes it more complicated, but it helps it run not only more efficiently and more, more powerful, right, because it's more efficient, but it also helps it run a lot cleaner. Um, so the trend is, is to <clears throat> move away from flathead engines or L-head engines and move towards uh, overhead valve engines. And so more and more engines you're going to see are going to be overhead valve. In fact, it's hard to go to a small engine shop these days or even your big box store that sells lawnmowers and find a lot of flathead lawnmowers. They're getting harder and harder to find because they just, they just run a lot dirtier than overhead valve stuff. So the presentation script that we're looking at here, it's about working on and taking apart an overhead valve engine. Now I'm gonna clear out my drawings again and I'm gonna go back a few slides and look at these two engines again. Um, when I look at these engines, this is my overhead valve engine it even has this valve cover on the top and it says OHV, overhead valve. So it's gonna cost more money, but it's gonna actually run more efficiently. It's likely to have more power um, and it's gonna run cleaner. This other engine that you see here, this guy is my flathead engine. And you can see it does make the engine a little smaller, doesn't it? It also makes it cheaper to build. And so the really the only advantage for the small engine manufacturers to continue to make a flathead engine is it's a really inexpensive engine. And so that allows them to produce a product that's like, if you bought the, the cheapest lawnmower for sale at Walmart, it, it might have a flathead engine on it because it's just the cheapest way to build an engine. It's a lot less complicated um, to produce. Um, I actually think in a lot of cases, they're, they're more of a pain to work on to, to get the valves springs in and out of the engine. Um, but uh, so if you're working on older stuff, I'll put old over here. A lot of old, older equipment is going to be flathead. More modern stuff's going to be overhead valve. Okay. Moving right along. So we've done overhead valve. We've done flathead engines. Next thing we need to do is we need to talk about some identification of our engine. What the heck are we working on, right? And um, what Briggs and Stratton does is if the engine is, is new, right? Engines built in the early 2000s to newer, they will put some numbers and barcodes and stuff on a sticker on the side of the engine, but also stamped into the valve cover they'll actually stamp in this number. Now this, in, this number is called the model type and code. Um, and it allows you to identify exactly what the engine is. And one thing about working on stuff, especially if you're not just gonna take it apart, you're actually gonna try to put the engine back together. You have to identify what you're working on so that you can get the right parts and you can get the right specifications. So whatever you're working on, look for some numbers on it, and then you can use the internet to help you figure out what those, what those numbers mean. In fact, I'm gonna show you here in a minute where I have some more resources for you related directly to Briggs and Stratton to figure out this model type and code number system, okay? Uh, we actually have an activity that we're gonna do on that. Clear drawings. All right. Um, I want to wrap up with just a review of the four stroke cycle. So there's some much better videos than what I'm doing here available to you on the power portal. We'll take a run through on that real quick. Um, but just to review the four cycle theory intake, the pistons moving down on the intake stroke, the intake valve opens up. It lets in the fresh air fuel mixture into the engine. Compression, both valves now close. The piston moves up. It squeezes the air fuel mixture together. That mixes up the air fuel mixture really good. It actually starts to heat up the air fuel mixture. So that's the compression stroke that's really important. 
the power stroke. At the top of that compression stroke, the spark plug fires. And that provides that last little bit of heat energy that you need to ignite the air fuel mixture. And that then pushes the piston down on the power stroke. So we ignite our air fuel mixture up here. This creates a lot of heat and a lot of pressure and that pushes the piston down. In fact, the power stroke is what it's all about. That's what we're trying to get out of the engine, right? That one power stroke out of these four strokes or four cycles, that one power stroke is what actually makes the engine work and mow our grass or drive our car for that matter. Um, so that pushes the piston down from that expanding air fuel mixture as it burns, right? And then finally, we have our exhaust stroke. So once the air fuel mixture is all burned up, about that time the piston has reached bottom dead center, the exhaust valve begins to open up. So this exhaust valve opens up right here. The piston then starts to move up. And as soon as the exhaust valve opens up, exhaust gases start to flow out. But one of the things that makes a four cycle engine run more efficiently than a two cycle engine is that it really does a good job of, of pumping those gases out. So the piston continues to move its way up and help expel all those exhaust gases out so that it can start this whole process over again. So if I, if I go intake compression power exhaust, I end up where my piston then is at the top of its stroke called top dead center at TDC of the exhaust stroke. So it starts at bottom dead center, BDC, moves up to TDC, top dead center, and it does that on the exhaust stroke. Well, it ends up at top dead center at the end of the exhaust stroke, and guess what? Now it's all lined up to start everything all over again. So if I back this thing up, it would be queued up to start the intake stroke again. So intake compression power exhaust, intake compression power exhaust, it just keeps doing that over and over and over and over. Um, and that's how that engine's gonna run. All right, so with that, um, I, have, I have a question. Um, for you guys. Oh, cool. We, we got a, a few more people on here. All right. So we, we've been talking about the, um, the four stroke uh, cycle. And my question for you guys would be is how many times around, if I uh, fix my drawing tool here, how many times around does this crankshaft go in one four stroke cycle? It goes intake, I guess I should do it the right way. Intake, then it goes up on compression, power, exhaust. But in that process, how many times does the crankshaft down here spin around? And I'll go ahead and um, roll through the pictures again, right? Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Um, I don't know, did, did anybody pay attention to how many revolutions of the crankshaft? Does anybody want to share that? You could share it on the chat, or you could, you could yell out if you if you un, um, unmute yourself. You should be able to unmute yourself. You could uh, just call it out there. Okay. So the Stig here says twice. Yes, that's correct. Good deal. So it takes two revolutions of the crankshaft for one four-stroke cycle. So the the crankshaft has to go around two complete revolutions if. Um, if you're a skateboarder, right, that would be 720 degrees, right? Because you're pretty good if you can spin around twice on your skateboard and do a 720, right? If you're Tony Hawk, maybe you can do that in the air or something. Um, so 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation for one four stroke cycle. Out of those four strokes, how much power, how much time did you get power on there? Well, we only had one power stroke. So we really were only applying power to that thing for 180 degrees. Um, kind of an interesting side note. Anyways, um, a two-stroke engine, and this, this presentation, of course, it's from Briggs and Stratton here, and Briggs doesn't build two-stroke engines, so they just kind of ignore them. Um, 
but uh, uh, a two cycle engine, it does its whole process. It's two cycles uh, that does one revolution of the crankshaft. So a two stroke engine inherently will make more power than, in a, than the same sized four stroke engine because it only takes one revolution of the crankshaft for a two stroke cycle where it takes two revolutions of the crankshaft for a four stroke cycle. So if I have an engine that's gonna be handheld, let's say a chainsaw or something, right? Where I'm holding it in my hands and I don't want it to be really heavy and I want it to be very powerful, like a chainsaw, a two stroke engine works good for that because it's a lot of power in a small size. So it's a light engine, it's not super complicated, doesn't run nearly as clean or as efficiently, but it makes a lot of power for its size. And that's why there's two stroke engines are still popular for things that you hold in your hands, right? Chainsaws, string trimmers, a lot of people call string trimmers weed eaters. Um, weed eaters technically a brand name. So a lot of the small engine guys will get after you if, if you call it that. But um, where this engine that's on the screen would be very heavy to be holding in your hands on any piece of equipment, right? So. Um, Again, this teardown script follows this engine, this Intec 206. So it's a 200 cc four stroke engine that's overhead valve. And it goes through the whole thing. How do you take out the air filter, the air filter back, the, the gas tank and throttle assembly and muffler. And so I have it loaded on canvas there for you as a good reference if you're taking stuff taking stuff apart. All right, um, I'm gonna get that out of the way. I have our Canvas page back up and there's that presentation again. I'm gonna go back to the modules tab because I realize I, we do have to, we have to wrap this, wrap this thing up. It's been about an hour. Um, I also need to give you a, a few minutes for questions and answers. I wanna, I wanna finish off on, um, on a couple of things. In that presentation, I showed you some engine numbers and I said, hey, there's information here on engine numbers. So I'm under the modules tab. We're in module one, engine operation and theory. And we have um, some files here about how do you read those engine numbers? So that's out of the first page of the Briggs and Stratton manual. I have this kind of displayed a couple different ways. Um, some students I find like that one. Um, other students like this one because it kind of shows you where the numbers are stamped into the engines. And again, it has that same information of what, what do the numbers mean. But really, uh, probably the best thing is this presentation that we put together here. Engine numbers and what do they mean? Where do you look for the numbers? So this is on the front of the blower case. I had to take this uh, throttle cable out of the way so that you could see it a little bit better. And there's the numbers. Essentially, this number, model type and code on Briggs and Stratton, that's kind of like your VIN number for a small engine, except it's particular to Briggs in that the, these numbers would mean something different on a Kawasaki than they would mean on a Briggs and Stratton. So like here's one of our school engines is that Intec 206. On the valve cover, it's got a series of numbers. Now, what do the numbers mean? Again, you saw the handout, but in the, um, in the presentation, it actually tells you everything. The first two are the cubic inches of displacement. Then you got the design series. What's going on with the crankshaft? Is it vertical shaft or horizontal shaft? Uh, what type of bearings are in the engine? type of starter. So electric starter is different than a pole starter, different than a rope starter, all that type of stuff. Um, then we have the type, it has some specifics, and then it has the date. So the first two are the year. So if you want to figure out like what year is this engine from, that's the, that's the first two digits. So in this presentation, I actually give you some examples and then we finish off we finish off where we look at some real engines and what their numbers are, and we ask you to figure it out. Um, so 
part of working on anything is learning about what you're working on. And so those engine numbers will tell you what year was the engine built. And basically, you know, what is this engine? What a lot of information about it. Now, um, once you, once you know that if it's a Briggs and Stratton engine, you can then get the manual for it. So I went back to our home screen. I'm going to the modules tab. I want to show you a couple of things. Um, I'm just going to click on the Briggs and Stratton login info, right? Hopefully you guys have all logged into this at this point. There are several links on the site um, that, uh, you know, link you back to the power portal. And notice I clicked this link and it took me to the login screen. If I actually log in, it would take me right to where I wanted to go. So to make this thing a little faster, I actually logged into the power portal already. And so this is, this is your home screen with your power channel tab is up and it's got all your courses. Um, a lot of you guys have already viewed this four cycle theory, which is great. Um, this button right here takes us to technical courses. And for the majority of our class, we're reviewing stuff in this basic section, right? the compression course is where we're at right now. And um, actually they have this all split up, but if you want to watch the whole thing, the very last one, this video in the bottom here, uh, shows you that. So there's also subtitles that you can put on um, if you need those. So a um, lot of good, a lot of good information on here. But I said, hey, there's, there's manuals for you on here. Well, from this main screen, if I click the Briggs and Stratton logo, you'll see this tab, Engine Repair Manuals. And if I click that, I can look up a manual for any Briggs and Stratton engine. So um, for example, I will load up our document camera again. We were using it earlier to look at our tools. And there it is. All right. So here I have single cylinder L head repair manual built after 1981. That's the manual for all those engines. And so if I look at all the engines in the picture here, this manual is made to, to work on all of them. It's got the specifications, it's got the procedures, all those type of stuff. But what if I have an overhead valve engine, right? Air-cooled overhead valve engines, there's a different manual for that. Okay, those manuals are on the Power Portal site. So if I go back to my Power Portal, All right, let's close that out. It always positions itself right in the way, so I need to click something that's not on there. All right, so if I go back to the power portal, I'm going to type in L head. So I did have to know. I did have to know a little bit about the engine. So L single cylinder L head after 1981. If I open that up, that'll be this exact manual that I have right here. Um, it gives me a part number 270962 that lines up with the part number that I have. And I can scroll through here and I can see the same specifications that I see in this manual right here. You know what's kind of funny is I just happened to stop this on this page. Earlier we were talking about how stuff can correspond to different things. I said, hey, a 19, 9 sixteenths is pretty close to a 14 millimeters. 
it shows you that right there. So anyways, um, so the manuals to the Briggs and Stratton engines are on here. I'm going to type in um, overhead valve, OHV, OHV, and let's see what we get that way. All right, single cylinder overhead valve. That's the other book I had on the table, right? And you can see, you can download this thing. It's a big PDF file. Page for page is, is what's in there. So what, what I will say is that these are specific to Briggs and Stratton engines, but a small engine is a small engine so a lot of these steps and procedures will be very similar whether you're working on a Briggs and Stratton or a Tecumseh or a Honda for that matter. Now, let's say you're working on something like a, like a motorcycle. Well, those are going to be more sophisticated. And so um, one thing about our small engine stuff is that if you have a more expensive engine, you know, it's, it's more valuable and parts cost more money, right? Um, but that also let, lets you know that, hey, you really do need to make that investment. And unfortunately, we're like, if you work on cars, we have databases like all data I have up on the screen right here. We have Mitchell On Demand, Shop Key Pro. They don't really make that for the small engine world. So what that means is that you'll end up having to buy individual manuals for what you're working on. Now those manuals might cover several models. So again, I'll pull up that darn document camera that likes getting in the way of all my other features. But here I have a Honda manual. Now this, this covers my old XR80s, CRF80s, XR100s, 1992 to 2009. So there's a lot of years there but it's, it's specific to Honda motorcycle engines um, from those years, right? So what I would say is if you're working on another brand of engine, especially if it's something that you're not just planning to take it apart for the credit of the class and to kind of learn how it works, but you really want to get it put back together, you're going to want to make that investment and get a manual. Now, sometimes you can find even manuals like this right here Somebody has downloaded it, made it a PDF, made it available on the web. Sometimes those are free. Sometimes those cost a few dollars. So there is options. Um, if you're working on a Briggs and Stratton engine, you have access to all the shop manuals now with your Power Portal login. But if you're working with a different brand, you are going to have to um, kind of do some research on your own and get a manual for it. Uh, look up some engine numbers. We'll go ahead and go back to the modules tab. We'll look at that activity. If I scroll down, engine identification, uh, model type code. So he, here's, here's that activity to do. Um, it's all set up where it shows you the numbers for four engines. The idea is that the last engine is your engine. You look up your own numbers. I realize that this numbering system is specific to Briggs and Stratton. Um, so if you have a different brand of engine, just, just try to use Google or something to try to figure out what you got. Because a big part of, of figuring out how to work on something and fix it is to first identify what you have, what year it was built, and to get some service information on it. Okay? So um, that is what I had for you today. I wanted to show you where some things were at in Canvas. We spent a little bit of time on the Briggs and Stratton Power Portal. I showed you how you can look up, uh, get service manuals on that, where your, uh, you know, engine theory operation training and stuff was on that. Um, keep in mind, I'm always adding stuff here to uh, Canvas to make it better. One of the things we just did was kind of lay out this stuff a little bit better so it was easier to figure out the different sections. So I'm kind of working with some other instructors to help me streamline the site and make it better and better for you guys. Um, so my hope is that this week you guys will, you know, get through this module one information, engine basics, 
you have some activities to do on there for Briggs and Stratton and for still and the engine numbers exercise. These would things we would be normally doing if the class was, was um, an in-person class, we'd be doing these same things. And then as we get going, then we'll progress to module two, which is all about the, the diagnostics and, and um, uh, you know, it has some lubrication stuff and you know, just all kinds of good information in there. And that's where we get into to taking, apart some, uh, taking apart some stuff. So with that, um, what I wanted to do is, you know, answer any questions some of you folks might have um, of me um, working on stuff or about the class or anything. Um, do any of you guys have questions on different things in the class? You can uh, use the chat because I have that up or you could call it out, right? If you un, uh, unmute yourself. Um, but if, if anybody has any questions, maybe on uh, tools or um, if you have an engine project, okay. Also, uh, don't forget if you go um, to the, where is it, to people, Let's see, home, I'm trying to think of how, oh, I know, it's the inbox. If I go to the inbox, I, which I can't do in my student view, but that's where you can go to compose a email message to me. So you can always shoot me an email on stuff. All right, so um, I hope you guys picked up some information. What I'm gonna do with this um, uh, class session we did, did today is I'm going, I've been recording it. I'll try to edit it a little bit better and we'll get it loaded up so that you guys can, um, so that you guys can go and uh, people that weren't available to be online with us today, they can go and watch it later, right? Because we did cover quite a bit, whether it was tools, some shop safety stuff, um, or how to get the manuals and that type of thing. So, so we'll, we'll make sure that all these class sessions that we do, um, I'll put a recording up there. Um, so if you, uh, yep, thank, thank you, Caitlin. Okay, so you're good too. Um, so if you have questions, just make sure you send them my way or uh, tune in next week, we'll, we'll do this again. Um, I had two groups, by the way, in the class. A lot of folks said, hey, they wanted to do this. Um, they wanted Monday nights. Um, and about the other half of the students really wanted Tuesday mornings. Um, and by the time I got the data and realized that those were my two groups, I figured it was too short of notice to do it on a Monday night. Plus in my shop here, it was probably like 110 degrees in here last night. So we chose Tuesday morning, um, but I'll alternate it back and forth between Monday nights and Tuesday mornings to kind of make, so that both groups are able to um, to hopefully attend one session kind of in person or, or online live um, and get their questions answered. And like I said, I'll, I'll make sure that I post everything uh, with video links later, okay? So with that, I'll let you guys get back to your, your, uh, your regular lives. Uh, hopefully you can round up some small engine projects and stuff. If, if some of you are out there and you don't have a project or you're having a hard time rounding up some stuff, send me a message because I can, I can round up some projects and, and we can figure out a way maybe to get them to you if you're, if you're local to the Sacramento area, um, if you're really needing uh, something to work on, okay? All right, until next time, everybody take care. Thank you guys for tuning in today. I really appreciate it. And uh, again, if you have questions, uh, please be sure to ask. All right, see you later.